So, okay. So, uh, hi and welcome everyone. Um, this was supposed to be a hybrid or an online but, uh, uh, talk, but uh, uh, Andreas told me that he would give the talk online and we had people connecting from various places. But Charlie's in the classroom. So we can consider it as a <laughs> as a hybrid as a hybrid talk. Anyway, so uh, today the Sloan Lab team will give a presentation on the project. The title of the, of the presentation is uh, "Looking Back to Build Future Shared Collections." And um, Andrea, the floor is yours. Uh, so you can start whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation uh, and thanks everyone for joining. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see my screen all right? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's, oh, do you see my, do you see my presentation mode? What do you see? Yeah, we don't see the slide. We see, we see the, the notes. You also see the notes, yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, excuse me, just for a moment. Um, I think that should do the trick now. Or that. Yay. All yeah. Right. Good. Okay. So Sloan Lab. Uh, this is a, a presentation that is going to take you through uh, all the kind of research outputs that we are de developing and working on the last couple of years on the Sloan Lab. The presentation is uh, Look Back to Build Future Shared Collections, which is the main title of the project. As you already uh, or you might know, the Sloan Lab is part of this uh, call that uh, has been um, uh, uh, basically attracted five separate uh, projects. It is known as the uh, Towards a National Collection uh, Initiative, and they're called Discovery Projects. So uh, these are projects that they try to work around the uh, data, coll the collections as data or the collections at the national level, trying to create uh, infrastructures that they can bring uh, collections of the nation together and Sloan Lab seems to be one of the most uh, integral areas uh, in that uh, in that call coming from a very historical perspective. Other projects they looked at uh, uh, different domains like science and arts uh, and community uh, data. Now in terms of our project clearly as the name uh, is um, you know uh, implies we're looking at the Sloan collection uh, people might already know who Sloan is, but uh, let's uh, see a little bit about who is this person who was a, a very well-known uh, British physician and naturalist and collector uh, that uh, he lived in the, uh, uh, you know, late uh, 17th, uh, mid 18th century. He uh, collected over 7,000 objects uh, through being involved a lot with um uh with Jamaica with Jamaica plantations that you got uh, wealthy from those uh, uh activities clearly we do recognize that uh, the way that these collections have been developed uh, involved a lot of uh, transatlantic slavery uh but nonetheless we are focusing on uh the collection itself uh, although later on uh Alda and Marco would also highlight some of the issues uh, that the project is addressing from a uh, community perspective and from participatory uh, design um, methods. I'm going to focus mostly on the technical aspects. Now, this uh, specific collection or the, um, the majority of the collection, it is dispersed around three main institutions, the British Museum, the Natural History Museum and the British Library. What this collection is about, well, you can think about it is about everything. So uh, the collection contains artifacts uh, from, uh, you know, from the antiquity up to medieval times. It contains books, it contains as well uh, specimens. Uh, it, it is a very diverse, a very uh, rich collection uh, of a person that had a very specific interest 
into understanding the world of his time, I would thought, you know, therefore he has uh, created a, a very rich and unique catalog of his collection and all the items that uh, basically collected through these uh, years of him being involved uh, in this process. So uh, these are some examples of the things that we might find in the collection. Uh, but basically, the project clearly is about reuniting a collection that once used to be uh, unified, if you want, under, uh, under uh, Sir Hans Loan and cataloged under his manuscripts. But, you know, due to the time, uh, the collection has been found its way to different institutions and to different uh, types of cataloging uh, practices uh, and curational practices, etc. So basically, we're looking at what was then. So at the very bottom, we can see that uh, we're talking about the manuscripts, the catalog manuscripts that uh, Sloan himself created for cataloging his collection. And today, the contemporary, if you want, databases that they hold these items. So we can see that items are in the National History Museum that they relate to National History Museum, like specimens or artifacts in the British Museum or books, printed books or medieval manuscripts that they are now available from the British Library. Clearly, one of the main challenge, even if we don't look at the historical collection, even only looking at the uh, contemporary collections, is trying to unify a, um, a set of, if we call it simply metadata, a set of collection items that they are dispersed across different systems. Even that is a, is a big challenge on its own, uh, let alone considering the historical manuscripts that uh, we're going to discuss in a moment. So uh, clearly we do have the physical items that appear in, in the museum collections. Uh, and we do have a, a set of different content management systems, a, a set of different cataloging systems with different standards and, and uh, metadata schemas that they catalog this uh, huge collection. So even unifying that at the first stage is a, is a great challenge. I'm going to discuss also how we can integrate into this process the historical manuscripts. So uh, the main goals or the abstract goals of, of the project clearly is to aggregate multiple records from different resources. So we do act, the Sloan Lab does act as an aggregator, uh, but also uh, we need to create a common layer of um, a common uh, model, uh, a common layer of uh, data model for unifying this collection. Uh, therefore, we need to look at specific modeling techniques. There are certain standards that we can uh, start from or we can incorporate, uh, but uh, let alone the collection comes with its own challenges. Uh, and then also together with integrating the data, we're looking at something more uh, to build something more interactive, something uh, you know more of a uh, of a interactive environment and re a, a, a rich kind of application that is known as the knowledge base. So we need to integrate everything into the knowledge base. And of course, by doing this, we need to follow certain uh, methods and techniques that uh, leverage uh, the practice and we work towards interoperability. So we do create an output that is interoperable now, but also can sustainably uh, stay in the future as an output uh, that future generations can use, at least oh, they, they have a certain way of dealing with it. Um, most importantly, uh, we also look at the area of multivocality. This is because this is a collection that has been curated for over 300 years. Uh, we do have very different domains looking at the collection, different curational practice, different views of the collection itself as things have developed and progressed uh, in the world that we are living in. The proposed architecture, and without going into huge detail into that, uh, is this one. This is what was set uh, at the initial proposal, and this is the actual roadmap that we are working on it uh, to develop. So as you would see at the very bottom, there is a kind of a busy diagram 
that tries to capture the diversity of the resources that are about to, to be integrated into a common data model. Oops, sorry. Uh, so basically, all this area is about the different uh, data sets that they are coming either from the British Museum, the British Library or the NHM, together with historical collections that they enjoy different levels of uh, digitization. Some of them are just physical, they are not even being imaged. Some of them, they might be imaged. Some of them might be imaged and OCR. Some others, they are already in text decoding uh, transcription. Uh, so harmonizing all that input and bringing that into a common data model is the very first step, uh, together with creating something which is far more uh, enriched, the knowledge base, which together with uh, the data is uh, also enriching the, the the data itself with references from vocabularies, with definitions for vocabularies, with uh, links to the linked data cloud, before all that becomes available to a, an application layer that we can use to query uh, the data, uh, to interrogate, to get visualizations out of the data, uh, to run inferences and other kind of uh, applications that might, uh, you know, data lend to. Uh, and on the side, we have all sorts of other kinds of outputs that they relate to serialization of the, which they look basically to interoperability, how we can share the data, how we can make available the data to different kind of um, of applications other, that they, other than the main application that we are developing. So to make a data interoperable beyond uh, the, the strict boundaries of our knowledge base, if you want. So the main starting point clearly was to make a sense of what data we are going to be working with. Uh, and people had very different views of uh, the available data sets. Some that were quite uh, obvious to people because they were more prominent, some other were are better known to uh, experts, but not wi widely uh, communicated, if you want, uh, across uh, the broad uh, team or across, uh, you know, the boundaries of uh, an expert practice. Uh, so understanding the data environment was important. Therefore, uh, we worked towards creating the Sloan Lab Data Atlas. That gave us the chance um, to see what resources are, are available, how relevant these resources are to uh, the Sloan Lab. And uh, that also was very important for us in order to set a, a plan for ingestion. So to get some priorities about what data is available, uh, what is the, gonna be the actual plan and pipeline of ingesting data, depending on how much of, um, um, of arrangement or, or of uh, adaptation or kind of um, you know work at the end of the day we need to do with the data sets before they become unified with a knowledge base. So the data atlas was uh, created to give us exactly that uh, bird eye view, if you want. Uh, and here is the data atlas as it has been uh, created um, initially and as it is now, maybe with a few more refinements as we're going to see later on. So basically what we see here is that we do have data sets that they are originating or they belong to the British Library, to the British Museum, to the National History Museum, which are the key players, but also we have data sets uh, sitting in the Royal Society. These are draft minutes. Uh, uh, we also have some uh, additional smaller kinds of projects that they have mobilized data like the uh, Adam Matthew uh, project. Clearly, we do have the Enlightenment Architectures, which was a project uh, developed here in UCL by Julian uh, Nihan uh, and um, the British Museum where uh, manuscripts have been uh, transcribed in TI. And in this process, in the Atlas, we try to figure out the stages that each of these uh, data set is, basically whether it is imaged or it is transcribed, what is the level of uh, structure and digitization, and also to, uh, to make some sense between the historical resources, which are the original uh, historical manuscripts, and the modern 
kind of uh, data sets that exist in databases, in contemporary databases. So basically these are uh, the main key players as I have, and also the Sloan letter is another uh, resource quite uh, important, but on the periphery of the main collection. Uh, and what we see here basically is a list of all the historical manuscripts that uh, ever existed. At the very bottom, you would see that some manuscripts have been also lost in the process. Uh, most likely they've been lost during the uh, World War II. 11 of those uh, volumes have been, uh, have been lost. Uh, due uh, to uh, London bombing bombings, um, and these are the Sloan manuscripts. Uh, in its uh, later version, in this, in, the, in its latest version, uh, the the data atlas is capturing this form of details. So we can see here basically the manuscripts. Uh, whether the, there are outputs of digitization, whether there are outputs of transcription in triple keyed, or if they are text encoded, and where they are available. Similarly, we can look at databases that they hold group of objects, and that is for the British Library. And from left to right, uh, we just capture the level of digitization and availability. Great. So by the time we got a chance to look and review what is available to us, we also had to look at how we can model now data under a unified layer to allow us basically to drive the unification process within the uh, and leading to the knowledge base. Uh, now, the CDOC CRM is a standard uh, conceptual schema. Other people call it uh, ontology. It's a bit uh, high level ontology for modeling uh, museum uh, data or cultural heritage collections. And it's a very good starting point. It is a very well known standard and a very rich uh, environment for modeling data. Uh, but uh, we need to make certain kind of design choices when we move into applying uh, that standard uh, for the modeling uh, requirements of the project. And clearly, we also need to extend it to address specific uh, requirements that they relate to uh, to the collection. Um, the for without going into much detail, the the model allow us to um, to define specific items. Think of it as a metadata catalog or a metadata schema. Clearly, we are talking about physical objects in many cases, and we are talking about uh, or we are modeling things that they relate to to those physical objects. Uh, sometimes uh, they are relating to a place or a person uh, or, or uh, you know a curated holding basically belonging to a uh, specific uh, kind of collection or sub collection. Uh, that is quite straightforward for people to address. But what's quite um, challenging in our case is that the collection is not only about objects. It is also about books, which we can think as objects, but it's also about specimens. Uh, and then we, we have a variation of different types of physical objects, and we have a huge variation of how these objects or items are cataloged. Therefore, our design focus has shifted into the information object. So basically the node of unification, if you want, is the information object. The information object itself is an object that gathers information about an item, which can be a physical object. And together with it, we can hold all the different important metadata or important sets of data to this record because the unification is happening at a record level not at a uh, physical object level. Um, I mean, we can we can start talking about these details in a, you know about these design details in a greater uh, extent. But um, this is just what I would I would like to highlight at this point that our intention here or our um, collection is based on information objects. So we aggregate on uh, on record sets or records rather than physical objects. And this is why this is important because let's see, uh, we do have a specific object uh, here uh, that you know it has a material um, 
plant material is uh, soapstone. It has a place of origin in China. It has a type, which is a cup, and it has been collected by a person uh, which is uh, known as Mr. Pinfold that later on uh, um, uh, made this object available to Sloan. What really happens with this specific object, if we want to look at it uh, from a unification process, there are uh, at least two different records. Uh, there might be more than that, but you know, two main records is the historical record. So basically it's the record about this object as it has, it has been created by Sloan and another record, which is the contemporary record held by the British Museum. Uh, nonetheless, uh, through the curational practice, the original kind of point of reference, which is uh, this uh, identifier here, somehow uh, has remained as, as a, a, a kind of consistent between the historical record and the uh, contemporary record. So that gives us a little bit of a chance to be able to find uh, cross-linking between these data sets. But uh, at the same time, we do have two separate records. And here, what you can see is that um, we do uh, introduce a, a new kind of property here. We extend a little bit the model to say that the pro that the physical object that exists in the British Museum record is believed to be the same as the physical object that is mentioned, not explicitly sometimes, uh, to the uh, uh, digital entry to the to the entry that is digitized from the historical records. Yeah, so basically we do have two record sets about the same object, one coming from the historical 300 year old uh, catalog, another that is coming from the contemporary data set. So that is at the level of uh, of objects and uh, themselves and the, the way that the objects have been uh, uh, curated and cataloged into the contemporary systems and how they've been cataloged historically. Together with that, there is another set of, uh, of resources that also contribute to uh, the Sloan Lab. Uh, one of its and the most uh, kind of most important uh, resource here that has been mobilized is the Ray Plantarum. That is, you can think of it as an encyclopedia of its time about plants. Now, the personal copy of Ray, of, uh, excuse me, of Sloan, has been used as a, uh, as an index, if you want, to the herbarium. Basically, uh, Sloan created a huge herbarium by uh, bringing together specimens from Jamaica, from other places. Uh, and the only way that we would find our way within this herbarium is through this personal copy, this personal encyclopedia of Ray. So what really... Uh, Sloan has done here is that, uh, as we can see it, you know, um, on, on the screen, uh, there is a plant name with uh, this polynomial kind of reference, uh, contemporary to, to his time. And uh, simply the personal copy says that this specific item, this specific specimen is available in my herbarium at this specific volume, at this specific page. This is the only way that we can basically, or we had up to up to Sloan Lab, uh, a way to uh, find specimens within the herbarium. Um, mobilizing this uh, resource was very important. So basically, what what you know what we needed to be done is together with transcribing in a simple sense was also structuring the data and basically create these links between plant names uh, and references to the herbarium by linking the marginalia, which are the handwritten marginalia here provided by Sloan with the plant name itself. Uh, it was a very uh, elaborate uh, task and a, a very challenging task that involved automation and semi-automation and manual um, operations. Uh, but nonetheless, we have managed to extract from, uh, and you can see the numbers here, uh, from around 2,000 pages, uh, something like 4,000 margin segments, uh, around seven uh, to 8,000 printed plant names and other uh, transcribed specimens uh, 
uh, which are also available from the footers. As we can see, the footers are all handwritten. Very complex uh, resource, very important resource, extremely, extremely important for finding uh, uh, references into the herbarium. Uh, what we see here is uh, one of the workflows. So uh, we used Zooniverse as uh, one of our tools to basically validate the links because uh, we could automate and find the segments, uh, these fragments on the page, but also we wanted to be in a position to validate that uh, the reference between uh, the margin and the plant name is correct because basically the link the link between these two was not explicit, was only by, uh, if you want, by uh, by place reference on the page. So uh, margins next to a plant name were relevant. But doing all that has also lent to some more advanced techniques. So there are three volumes in this Ray Plantarum. We have already annotated uh, these two volumes with automatic, semi-automatic methods which means that we have a very good data set to try some machine learning approaches. So we are looking into training a model with what we have created so far uh, for extracting similar pieces of information from volume three, which is a little more challenging than volume two. And the pipeline, as we can see it here, is uh, through the text recognition and pre-processing to create a model and through the model, try to do the same information extraction task by extracting pla uh, plant names uh, specimens and uh, marginalia from volume three. So this is also something uh, that we are working towards too and a very uh, useful output. Uh, coming, um, and I'm, I'm cautious of time, uh, uh, coming to the knowledge base, I have already mentioned that different types of uh, data that uh, are ingested. So we do have the historical catalogs the contemporary catalogs, but also we link to external resources. We do link to external um, link data uh, uh, places like Wikidata. And clearly we also ingest new forms of data as the one that we uh, mobilized with uh, the Ray Plantarum. And um, the application layer uh, over the Sloan Lab is running on um, on a system known as uh, MetaFactory. Uh, it is very similar system as uh, the research space is, is of those systems that they can help us interrogate uh, knowledge bases and knowledge graphs. And here we can see a, a couple of screens from the knowledge uh, base. Basically, the uh, knowledge base allow us to, uh, to search and interrogate or navigate uh, um, across uh, a huge environment of data through the well-known keyword search, but also there are additional um, tools, if you wanted uh, additional kind of options for users to engage with data. We can have more structured search uh, or search that is using the, uh, the semantics of, of the model. We can have a Sparkle endpoints for those that you want to write you know, queries on Sparkle directly. Uh, but also we make available uh, read spaces in link data view uh, and other visualization and graph views. Uh, here, for example, we can see the volume of data being ingested so far with uh, 14 data sets being ingested that these refer to uh, over 4,000 people, over 1,500 uh, specimens, uh, 700 places, etc. Overall, uh, we're talking about uh, 800,000 uh, 800, statements with 30,000 physical objects and information objects. And here we can see uh, the different data sets that have been ingested. Uh, and we do have visualizations that they come to show different people in the Sloan lab, different places, uh, also uh, graph views about um, uh, connections and relationships between uh, the records, uh, visualizations that can give us bird eye views or uh, other forms of uh, views that they allow us to um, to get uh, a better understanding of what has, is available in the knowledge base. 
coming to an end from a technical perspective, one of the most important um, tasks here when we aggregate things is also to look at the absences. I have already mentioned that 11 volumes, for instance, uh, from the original collection have disappeared during, uh, during the war, uh, but also there are other forms of absences that they uh, exist between the historical records and the contemporary records. Uh, such, such absences, they do relate also to objects that once that they've been uh, historically cataloged, now they are not available any longer uh, for seven reasons, for several reasons, uh, either have been lost, destroyed, or they are somewhere that we don't know. Also absences about people uh, that uh, either um, uh, identity, their identity is not explicitly mentioned or if they are uh, flagged as, as unknown. Uh, we also have people that have contributed to the collection and they are not mentioned at all uh, or they are mentioned uh, in, a, in a very vague way. And clearly that is also for people that they once used to own these uh, and they uh, uh, and these items have been taken from them. Uh, I'm talking about items that they have belonged to people, to enslaved people, and somehow uh, they uh, they came to the collection. And this is not well uh, highlighted clearly on the historical record, but this is something that needs to be acknowledged in the in the Sloan Lab. And, and again, people and places that uh, are might uh, mentioned in very vague terms, and we try to figure out how uh, we can reference and find more about them. Here, for example, is one of the visualizations that they try to address this. Uh, so we really, if you remember on the example that I have showed you earlier on, I was talking about an identifier, which was Sloan Lab, miscellaneous, one, two, three, four, five, something of that kind. We do have some sense that some of these identifiers have also found their way into the contemporary systems. Um, so there, there is a, a way that we can uh, devise to find out links between the historical and the contemporary records. And this is what we see from a um, from a historical catalog known as miscellanies. And this is basically the items, uh, the physical objects mentioned in the miscellanies catalog. And uh, with green, we can see clearly those items that we are certain that they do belong to the contemporary uh, set. So these are matched. Uh, there are some less, we are less certain for uh, for eight of them. Uh, two, they are in a next collection and, you know, uh, a great deal of them is not matched at all for several other reasons. Uh, the Sloan lab would give the option to find more about this because here it is the very first phase of trying to uh, to amend to mend if you want these links between the historical record sets and the contemporary record sets. This is the starting point of the low hugging fruit. With further interrogation, uh, Sloan lab give for the very first time the options to uh, researchers to be in a position to. Uh, to compare records across the historical setting and the contemporary setting to find uh, links and to start creating this kind of uh, relationships between record sets. Um, right. Uh, so I think this is where I, I will stop with the technical um, uh, review of Snow, Sloan Lab. And I will pass now to Marco, who is going to give us an overview uh, about the community fellows that play a very important role in, in Sloan Lab. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Andreas. So I will speak about the community fellowship scheme, which um, is technically hosted uh, by UCL and our department, although a uh, huge work of the mentorship of these fellows is actually facilitated by our colleagues at the Natural History Museum and the British Museum. But I thought this seminar would be um, a good opportunity to introduce this scheme um, to you because um, it has also been mentioned in some other meetings earlier um, in the department already. So as Andreas explained, the data aggregation of the Sloan collection is just the heart um, of what our project is doing. However, the Sloan Lab also aims to foster a critical understanding of the origins and development of museums and archival collections. 
and to explore the hidden and ignored processes of um, colonialism and, um, and it's, uh, it's slavery and how these processes have shaped uh, collections. And um, the crucial role for enabling this kind of research into these areas is, uh, is, is, is our community fellowship scheme. So throughout the course of our project, we support 10 community fellows. Um, the Fremont fellowships come with an award of 7,500 pounds. And while we're not overly prescriptive on the type on the research outputs um, of the fellowships, as long as they engage critically um, with the Sloan Lab data and our knowledge base, um, we seek to um, particular support um, individuals who um, help us to understand kind of this creative and research potential, potential of the Sloan Lab digital platform and data in the following areas. So for instance, examples of how the Sloan Lab enables to shed light on the geographic spread of collectors and knowledge about objects in the Sloan collections then the contested nature of museum collections and the um, role of digital tools for ground is ignored uh, and marginalized issues such as imperialism, um, colonialism, slavery, loss and destructions that have shaped the UK's national collections and also the potential of the Stone Labs digital tools for transferability and enhancement of other collections. Um, Five of the 10 fellowships um, we have are uh, ring fans to support in particular global majority individuals. So in total, we have um, three calls for the fellowships. The first one um, closed in January, 2023, the sec extended second call in September, 2023, and the third and final call um, this Friday, actually on 9th of February. So um, we don't have much time to go into the details of all these projects um, conducted by our community fellows um, and also because the fellows of um, round two uh, have just started uh, and I won't be able to report um, on, on their um, projects yet. Sorry, um, Andreas, could you go one slide back, please? Yeah, that's the one. Thank you. Um, but I will give you a bit of a taste of these kind of um, three fellowships of round uh, one um, who already completed their projects. So we were delighted to appoint um, Dr. Dorothy Kiagaba Sevoa, who examined technologies and methodologies um, of annotation uh, through the lens of the uh, Sloan's involvement in the transatlantic um, slavery and the local history of Jamaica. And her work resulted, for instance, in an educational video tutorial for one of the Natural History Museum's um, collections guides. Then um, Dr. Gail Chang-Kwan asked in Traveling Taxonomies how research in cross-disciplinary and diaspora diasporic fine art practice can complicate the ideas of fixed taxonomic boundaries and hierarchies in the Sloan catalog um, of miscellanies. And the output of our project was actually, um, I think one of the most astonishing and perhaps surprisingly um, outputs you could think of of a collections as data project um, as she made a proposal or a script for a ballet that engaged with the movement of these objects um, recorded in the um, catalog descriptions of Sloan. And then Anna Sophia Lipolis um, explored this concept of polyvocality in the Sloan collections. And um, she sought to understand how researchers can represent in machine readable ways historical biases um, in, in these collections and have different perspectives on the objects described um, in the collections. And her output includes a proposal for an ontology which um, supports multivocality and is also compatible with our Sloan Lab um, data model. Could I have the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So for round two, um, our fellows um, will be more even more embedded um, in the co-design activities of the Sloan Lab. 
Um, for instance, on 20th of February, um, they will be invited to a kickoff event where they will present their projects and also participate in a user experience um, session of the Sloan Lab um, knowledge base. The fellows we appointed for round two are um, Jermaine Watkins, um, Dr. Gavin Rees, Hannah Cusworth, Lucille John Kerry, and uh, Philip Rees Olney. If you're curious to learn more about the projects of the community fellows, um, we will be organizing in collaboration with the UCL Center for Digital Humanities, the Institute of Advanced Studies, and the Technical University Darmstadt, an online seminar series, uh, which will take place um, from April to July. And um, you will receive invitations for these uh, very soon. And um, it would be, of course, it, it would, of course, be delighted if you uh, would join one or the other session of these. May I have the next slide, please? So I, I, to conclude kind of this fellowship scheme, I thought it would be useful to share in this seminar some lessons learned about this scheme. Um, also, perhaps because it's perhaps also useful for similar activities that go on in departments, such as work placements or internships. So in respect of the opportunities uh, of this fellowship scheme is that is that for sure that, as you heard um, from this brief project overviews um, from the first round, that the uh, scheme really brings in new voices and the perspectives um, to the Sloan lab. Um, so the fellows of the first round address the layers of silences hidden in the arrangement of the collections where technical, artistic, and digital tool criticism perspective, and they really enriched our own practices and research on the Sloan collections as well. The benefit is also that the fellows open up opportunities for reaching out to wider networks. So Dorothy, for instance, collaborated with the Anti-Colonial Archive Working Group which is led by Cambridge Digital Humanities. And um, we were also able then to have like kind of follow up activities and research uh, workshops with them, where for instance, Alda um, presented as well. They are, have also some challenges. Um, so one of the main challenges is um, the kind of amount of staff resources um, that is required for not only the mentoring, but also all the tasks that kind of sit around um, this scheme itself. So for setting up the fellowship scheme, there were like we had to do intensive consultations with um, UCL Human Resources, EDI, and the legal departments. Then you have all the advertisement and management of the shortlisting. You have to conduct the interviews um, for the fellows. And um, then we also need to support the fellows with the uh, research ethics procedures at UCL. And there are some other administrative tasks. And I want to wish uh, to thank Karen here for his support, actually, uh, which is really invaluable for the um, ethics procedures uh, for the registrations um, here at UCL. Um, another, sorry, can I have the slide? Yeah, thanks. Uh, another set of lessons learned um, about our community fellowship scheme is in respect to the communication. So um, an interested individual from the Caribbean Studies Group, where among others we shared our call, gave us feedback on our fellowship description and advertisement text, for instance. And the feedback included that it's hard to see how the fellowship applies for to people from outside the digital humanities domain or more generally potential applicants with non-technical backgrounds. So for people with a more artistic background, such as writers, for instance, um, as the person was uh, who gave us the feedback, um, it's difficult, it was very difficult to fathom how kind of other sorts of projects would fit into the scheme. Although we're actually really keen to support also non-technical projects um, with our fellowships. Um, also, other inquiries that came out in by email indicated that our communication, what kind of projects uh, we're looking for could be improved. So as an action, we revised our application documentation and kind of re-articulated the project types we're looking for and providing more clear and succinct information on the historical context of the Sloan collections. Um, so 
this 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 uh, happened um, in before the third call. Um, so we'll be able to report back on the effectiveness of these actions after the third call closed on the 9th of February. And then the final challenge um, we experience is um, how to disseminate the outputs um, and results of the fellowships. This is because um, the fellows, while they engage with the resources and tools of the Sloan Lab, they conduct basically their independent pieces of research, uh, which is not curated by the Sloan Lab. And also there is this famous, in, this infamous um, sustainability question as the Sloan Lab won't be able to guarantee um, the hosting of the outputs um, after the end of the projects. So we need to ask the fellows to identify own platforms and avenues um, to, to host um, their outputs of the fellowships. Um, yeah, just briefly, I will keep it brief um, for regarding the ethics, um, but just to underpin what Elder will say in a moment about the co-design methodology. Um, of course, our research with the in terms of the co-design process of the Sloan Lab is um, approved as a low-risk research project by the faculty's research ethics committee. And we're able um, to accommodate a range of data collection methods, such as audio recordings and photographs and um, information gathering through online forms. But what's perhaps um, important to say is um, that one an important pillar to enable this kind of um, wide range of engagement and co-design with participants in our project was that we in the budget planning of the project, um, there was a lot of emphasis put on the compensation for the participants to open it up to as many individuals as possible. So participants receive 50 pounds per hour um, in their when they participate in our research activities and are also reimbursed for their travel and accommodation costs. Then I will um, hand over to Alda, which will talk more about the co-design process of our project. Um, thank you, Marco. So um, Sloan Lab uh, is clearly a very innovative uh, project. And one of the reasons for its innovation is also the model that it has established in terms of prioritizing um, um, certain material uh, above other, or also looking at the material through the eyes of those who will be the end users. Um, and in a sense, what I could say around the participatory co-design methodology that has been applied throughout the process of uh, creating Sloan Lab so far is that we have looked into um, kind of reflecting a shift from outreach to uh, participation using dialogical methods that put the user at the center um, of any kind of uh, platform um, to access these historical collections. And now the challenge for aggregating collections, uh, of course, is not only based on a lack of technology or legal constraints, but other soft factors such as trust in technology, policies and incentives for participants in aggregated collections also play an important role. And so um, the aims of um, the design, uh, the participatory co-design methods have very much been around the discovery of new questions, needs and interest uh, in the collections, but also, you know, new, new um, ways of looking at these collections. Um, thanks obviously to the incredible work that the um, technical team has carried out and Andreas has highlighted. Um, support the usability and obviously test the approach because um, this has been also um, a, a kind of seedbed for um, understanding how effective uh, the co-design methodology can be uh, in the context of aggregated collections like the Sloan Lab. We obviously um, have encountered a number of challenges uh, in the delivery of the um, participatory co-design activities. Um, these um, are listed here as um, obviously the fact that this is collection, um, uh, these collections are basically data um, when engaging with uh, in participatory activities people 
um, have sometimes also felt a little frustration of not being able to access the objects, but actually the description of those objects. Um, the use of specialist language, especially when it comes to the, um, uh, obviously, the, 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 the material held at the Natural History Museum. Um, the variety of users and uses, um, Sloan Lab, uh, obviously can be of incredible interest to many more uh, users than those who were traditionally attracted to the collection and what Marco has described before in terms of the variety of um, uh, fellowship projects reflects also obviously the variety of potential new users um, for, the, for the collections. And, and so how do we then integrate these new questions? How do we reflect these absences that have been raised, um, obviously, through the participatory activities? That has been, uh, obviously, a challenge. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what has been, in any case, paramount uh, in the design of the um, participatory uh, method has been an understanding of uh, developing activities that would uh, reject any kind of extractivism. Uh, and this is particularly important considering um, obviously the nature um, uh, of the formation of this collection. So if you can click um, again, uh, Andreas. So the non-extractivist co-design cycle has been uh, um, basically designed around a model which is incremental, iterative, and circular. So in terms of the way in which um, I have operated in connection, obviously, with my colleagues has been, first of all, trying to analyze what the work packages and the gatekeepers would need from the co-design activity. Then these would lead to uh, generate ideas. And these the ideas around the activity would obviously be also um, incremented by learning from previous activities. We would then deliver the participatory co-design activity with a variety of uh, potential users. And then um, uh, following that, there would be an evaluation and an analysis of the data gathered during the activity, followed by the sharing of the outcomes um, with the work packages for implementation. And as you can see, the process has been incremental, iterative, circular, so that actually any new activity would learn from the previous one and would incorporate further complexities raised um, by participants in the previous activity, so that we could also reflect this polyvocality of which Andreas has uh, talked about earlier in the uh, design of the participatory activities themselves. If we can move to the next slide. Um, so the, the model of practice has involved a number of um, activities and types of engagement. Uh, we've had online activities uh, where people have been able to give us um, information around their interest in the Sloan. Uh, we have had in-person digital activities. Then we've had focus groups, workshops, and more recently um, UX um, sessions, workshops where we have been testing and, you know, this is something that Fotei News also here um, in, you know, in, in, in um, um, as part of this workshop uh, today, this seminar today can tell us more. So um, the co-design activities today have been extremely successful in terms of the participants. We've had 135 people who actually provided information um, uh, through an online questionnaire of what would be their priorities when accessing the collection but also their digital habits, needs and interests. And this is a survey uh, which obviously can, can be of great interest uh, also for the department. Um, between October uh, 2022 and February 2024, we engaged with 145 participants who attended seven co-design workshops and one 
uh, UX workshop, and this included British Caribbean people interested in plants, experts in data modeling, metadata, and semantics, experts on Sehan's loan and museum curators, botanists, gardeners, seed heritage guardians, growers, but then also students, historians, researchers of the transatlantic slave trade, and heritage specialists. So, um, and um, we also delivered uh, two very important activities in Northern Ireland, one at the Down County Museum and one in the place of um, uh, Sir, uh, place of birth of Sir Hans Sloan, uh, his birthplace in Killily. So, as you can see, um, this vast engagement um, obviously has 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 brought an enormous amount of uh, information and material. The activities have been evaluated all the way through. They have reached um, a, a high level of satisfaction. 93% um, of the participants have scored uh, four or five uh, for satisfaction, and 97% of the participants have uh, confirmed that they learned something new um, through the activities, especially around the Sloan collection and the Sloan lab and so you know this is evidence of obviously you know the non-extractivist model working um, in terms of data gathering and results, um, we uh, collected um, people's visions and views and ideas uh, through online forums, but also through discussions. Um, this data has been then analyzed using nine categories that the I myself uh, devised in, con in collaboration with Andreas to make sure that they would fit the needs, obviously, of the um, technical team. And these categories, the data has been, as I said, um, um, analyzed both in quant in quantitative using quantitative and qualitative tools. In general, we can say that um, the activities have allowed us to learn more about accessibility, usability, and interoperability. And um, uh, and 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 then you know the four main areas, and I won't go too much into details uh, of the recommendations that then have emerged from this vast uh, engagement uh, and co-design process with uh, communities has been the importance of challenging racist narratives, uh, enhancing access um, through a number of uh, technical, um, but also you know. Um, participatory tools. And then if you want to go to the next slide, enhancing the interpretation and the UX interface. Now, this has um, been obviously uh, a very, um, uh, you know, extensive program. Um, the evaluation is, I think, about 40 pages long. Isabel um, has um, worked with me on this um, um, uh, uh, on, on the evaluation of this report. And so perhaps at some point it might be interesting also for the department to learn a little bit more in details around people's views. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we're just on time, two o'clock. Uh, I don't know if, if there is a little bit of time for any immediate question uh, because we also uh, have the, uh, the next. Yeah. Let me stop the recording first. And uh, thank you very much.